It is Wednesday afternoon, September 20, 20th, almost said 27th, sorry. Uh, September 20th, we are picking up in Bear Sheet, Genesis chapter 27. We're just reviewing the last verse of 26. We uh, have uh, that Esau was 40 years old. He married two daughters that were the Hittites. Actually, it's verse 34. <laughs> uh, so 34 and 35 of chapter 26. This was a grief, we're told in the next verse, to his parents, Yitzhak and Rivka, Isaac and Rebekah. Why was it a grief? Because the Hittites were not God-fearers. They were not worshiping the one true and living God of Israel. They were idol worshipers. Their whole pathway was opposed to the ways that God was having his people to go in. This is not who Esau should have married. He should have stayed within the family of faith. And uh, we're going to see it was especially a great concern to uh, Rebecca. Um, should they be involved in taking care of her in the last days of her life if her husband is gone and, and they're the ones around, how are they going to be helping her when they do not are not on the same page with the God of Israel? So it was a great grief in many ways. I think that they probably were living very worldly, very ungodly lives. We know Esau did not have a heart for his God. We saw that, that even um, what he thought should have been his, he didn't want it for spiritual reasons. He only wanted it for uh, the advantage for himself in the secular. We'll especially deal with that in chapter 27. So we'll go into chapter 27. And as I said in my text, we're going to come to a time that we've got a household. I'm going to say they're upside down. What happened? What's going on? How did we get these events that are here and what can we learn from them? Chapter 27, verse 1. <clears throat> now it came about when Yitzhak, Isaac, was old and his eyes were too dim to see that he called his older son Esau and said to him, before we get to what he said to him, Isaac was old. Okay, I'll give you that. He was 135, 136 at the time. Mm -hmm. Yaakov, Jacob, and Esau, his brother, were about 75 or 76 years old. We tend to not think of it in these terms. Um, Yitzhak, Isaac, was 60 when Jacob was born. Jacob was 91 when Joseph, his son, was born. Okay, now, if Jacob's, um, Jacob was 91 when Joseph is born, his son. Okay, grandson of Isaac. So if Jacob was 130 when Joseph was 39, because at 91, you know, he was born. So when we know that Joseph is 39, and I'll show you this in Scripture, that's how we know Jacob was 130, because Scripture tells us that. So that means that Joseph was born, well, we also know, and I'll give you all these Scriptures in a moment. Joseph was born 14 years or so after Jacob arrives at Laban, at Levon's house, which is where he's going to go in this chapter. Now let me show you in Genesis. We're just taking sneak peeks ahead, uh, but let me show you how the scriptures tell us this. Rochelle didn't just make this up and decide that she knows what age they are and all and so forth and so on. Uh, I'm sorry, my tablet's a bit did, slow. Did you say when Joseph was born 14 years. years after Jacob goes to Laban's. He's going to go live with Laban, but it's 14 years before Joseph is born. I thought Joseph was born on the way. No, that's Benjamin. Oh, okay. Yeah, on All his right. way back. Benjamin is All born. Right, that's Benjamin. And that's when Rachel loses her life in childbirth. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's, that's Benny, or Benji, or whatever you want to call it. It's his little brother, okay? okay? Genesis chapter 47 and verse 9 tells us, So Jacob said to Pharaoh, Now, I'm presuming you all know a little bit of Genesis, okay? Joseph's going to be sold by his brothers down into Egypt. He goes from slavery into prison. He gets released from prison to go to the throne, that he's going to be second in command under Pharaoh um, by the time the Lord raises him up. Now, that takes years to happen. I just did it in a sentence, but it takes years <laughs> to happen. After Joseph is raised up to that position where he's it, it got um, second, in second in command, he's got 
commanding abilities. He's got royalty uh, rights. Jacob goes down to Egypt. The, Joseph brings his family down because it's a time of famine in Israel, and so they go down to Egypt for food. Okay, this is when Jacob, Jacob, Jacob Yaakov, let me use my Hebrew, <laughs> said to the Pharaoh, The years of my sojourning are 130. Few and unpleasant have been the years of my life, nor have they attained the years that my fathers lived during the days of their sojourn journey. In other words, I'm not as old as my my father, my grandfather, but I am 130 years old. I've I've lived on this earth 130 years. So we know Jacob was 130 when he's standing before Pharaoh because of that verse. Okay, this is how we put everything together and we get these ages. In this same chapter, um, no, I'm sorry, go to chapter 41 now. We're backing up, go to chapter 41. And in 41, we're going to look at verses 46 and 53. In verse 46 of Genesis 41, we read, Now Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh, went through the land of Egypt. So if Jacob is 130 when he stands before Pharaoh, and Joseph has been in the throne room in that position, and Joseph got there when he was 30. That's how we back up, okay? So we're coming back on the age of Jacob. Um, what we have to know is by the time Jacob comes down, there's been seven years of plenty and two years of famine. So you have to add that time in there also. I'm confusing people, and I'm trying not to. I know how hard it is because even when I'm studying it, I have to try to, I'm better when I see it you know, the one I just hear it. But just trust me and we'll unfold it as we go. But that puts Joseph to be 39 at the time that Jacob is 130 before Pharaoh. In other words, the very year that Joseph came into the throne room was not the year that he brought Jacob down. We've got time that passes in there. So we know Jacob, I'm sorry, Joseph is 39 when he brings Jacob down and Jacob says, I'm 130. So, if you do math easily, do 130 minus 40, and you're at 90. Since we're only talking 39 years, we add one, and we're at 91, okay? So, that puts Jacob at 91 when Joseph was born, okay? Now, um, and if you want the seven years of abundance, the two years of famine, look, well, I think verse 53 starts that. Yes, verse 53 in this chapter. When the seven years of plenty which had been in the land of Egypt came to the end, and the seven years of famine began to come, just as Joseph has said, then there was famine, and it goes on. Okay, so that's why we know the timing from these verses. Um, the last verse that I want to show you to try not to confuse you is chapter 45 and verse 11. Genesis 45 and verse 11 there I will also provide for you, for there are still five years of famine to come, and you and your household and all that you have would be impoverished. Okay? This is what was being told to Jacob. If you stay in Israel, there's five more years of famine coming because God had shown prophetically in a dream that there would be the seven years of plenty followed by the seven years of famine. So this shows that there are two years of famine had passed. There's five years to go. Jacob, come on down to Egypt. I'll take care of you. You're my dad. Bring, bring the family. Bring the kids. Bring the grandkids. Bring the cousins. Bring 70 people approximately went down into Egypt that were of the Jewish clan at that time. They would have pretty much perished in the next five years had they not gone down. So uh, putting all this together again puts Jacob at 130 when he goes down into Egypt. Joseph at 39 when Jacob comes down to live in Egypt with his son, okay? Now, what else do I need to tell you for this background? Um, okay, wait, wait. So... Gotcha. Uh, how old was Joseph and Benjamin, or, or who was it that was born? The difference between Joseph and Benjamin, the... Um, Joseph was born in the 14th year of the 20 years that Jacob spends it with Laban. So six. six years right there, then give 
around a year in the, the traveling and the pregnancy, I'm going to say they were about seven years apart in age. Pretty close to that. I'm okay. Confused. Okay. N never mind, just go ahead. <laughs> okay. You've got Jacob. He's okay, I want to simplify it. Okay. Jacob is ninety one and Joseph is born. Okay? Oh, okay. Jacob is ninety one when he becomes a daddy to Joseph. Okay? Oh, Jacob. Jacob. It's 91 when... When Joseph is born. Okay. When Joseph was born? Uh-huh. And that's the grandfather, right? No? Joseph no. is the, the son of Jacob. The son, I remember. Jacob had 12 boys. He had them from Rachel and Leah, Bilhah and Zophah. Okay? When Joseph is born, Rachel's first born. Okay? He's 91. Jacob's 91. Okay, that's okay. Go ahead. Okay, I'll try to give you a timeline next week, yeah. or you know, or, or you can pull out. I can show you if my big chart, if it'll help you. It has a lot of detail. It might not help. Sometimes simple is better. So just know that that there's time. You know, there's these ages. Um, what I'm going to point out to you is when Jacob is living with Laban, Levon, Laban. Okay, he's there for 20 years. He works seven years for Rachel, Rachel. He gets Leah. He works another seven years to, he gets Rachel before that, but, you know, he's, he's promised to work seven more years to get her. Okay, that's 14 years. Then he works six more years for the cattle and so forth that should be his wages even though Laban's going to try to cheat him out of everything, but he works six more years. In that 14th year, moving into those six years, that's when Joseph is born. Joseph is approximately seven years old, six, seven years old, when the family starts going back to the promised land. Benjamin is born en route before they settle in the promised land, and Rachel dies in childbirth then. Okay, so, um, so, how much do I have to tell you? I don't want to confuse you. Okay, don't worry, just keep going, going. Okay, yes. okay. Joseph is Jacob's son, right? Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Look, yeah. look at chapter 30 and verse 25, real fast, maybe that will help. Chapter 30 oh, and verse 25. Boy. I'm trying to give you an overlay so you see where everybody fits, because we tend to compartmentalize and we don't realize you know the relations um, <laughs> verse 25 of chapter 30 says now it came about when Rachel had born Joseph that Jacob said to Laban send me away that I may go to my own place into my own country okay and here's where Laban's gonna bargain with him to work longer for flock you know as as for pay okay um, so that's where, you know, I'm showing you J Joseph was born when he was with Laban. Benjamin's born when they're on their way back to the promised land. Actually, just outside of Bethlehem. Okay, but we'll get to that when we get there. Um, so it took Jacob a little bit of time to travel from his home in the promised land to, they're going back to the family to where Abraham came from, to the land, the area called Mesopotamia, you know, or the Chaldees, that area. It took him a little time. So if he was 75, 76 years old when he sets out, let's just say he's approximately 77 years old when he meets Rachel and he's going to work for Uncle Laban. Okay? Okay. All right. So. Yes, his father-in-law. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I need to do. Sorry, folks. Yeah, yeah, we'll get into all that. I, I won't go there now. Okay, so he's 77 when he goes to Laban's. Okay? Oh, I didn't know he was that old. Yes, that's my whole point. You know, we picture a 20-year-old. We picture a 25-year-old. We don't picture a 77-year-old. They lived longer, I'll give you. But, you know, time has passed in here. So Isaac is 137 when Jacob goes to Laban. If Jacob's around 77 
and Isaac was 60 when Jacob was born, then that makes Jacob 137. That fits with where we are right now. Chapter 27 took place within a year or so of Jacob arriving at Laban. So if we know how old he is when he arrived at Laban, we can see how old he is here in chapter 27. That gives us Isaac's age, and that brings us back to chapter 27 and verse 1. Isaac's old, okay? He's about 135, 136, because he's going to be about 137 when Jacob arrives with Laban, okay? And again, Jacob's going to serve 14 years for two daughters, and he's going to serve six more years for the cattle that he's going to get. We get all of that in chapter 30, okay? 31, chapter, well, 30 and 31. Anyway, we'll get there. So, Jacob is old. He's not a youngster, but he's not as old as he thinks because he's going to live to 180. So, he <laughs> thinks he's about to die, but he's not going to die, okay? His eyes were too dim to see. Same thing's going to happen to Jacob. We read in chapter 48, when Jacob's old and, and ready to die and he's going to bless his sons, that he also had, um, eyes, his eyes were dim. Now, that fits with, you know, we kind of know, as you get older, your eyes don't work as well. That's why when it says for Moshe, for Moses, you know, he he was buried the day that God said, this is, this is the end. He took him up to Mount Nebo, showed him the promised land, and then he buries him up in Mount Nebo. And it says that his eyes weren't even dim. He was still vigor. He was still doing well. But Jacob, uh, I'm sorry, um, yeah, Jacob here, his eyes, no, Isaac here. <laughs> I'm so sorry, folks. Isaac's eyes were dim. What I want you to see in that is I believe there's a double play here. He spiritually got dim eyes in this chapter also. He's definitely not the spiritual giant that we see willing to be sacrificed, faith in his God that you'll raise me back up because I'm the promised seed that life is going to come through. So even though he lives, you know, like what, around 45 more years, dies at 180, and if you want proof of that, Chapter 35 and verse 28 will tell you that he was 180 when he passes. Ishmael, remember Ishmael? This is Isaac's half-brother, okay? Daddy Abraham, different mamas. Ishmael died at 137. He died 14 years before this then because there was 14 years difference in their age. But it could be that Isaac saw his half-brother die at 137. His eyes are dim. He's feeling old. And he thought, yep, yeah, it's my time to die too. We don't know why he was reasoning. Maybe he had a huge health problem that Scripture isn't telling us about. Whatever the reason, he really thought that he was very close to death. Now, what's his responsibility if he's dying? Pass that birthright on. This is when whoever has been being in training is going to be in position now. So Jacob's ready. I'm sorry. Lord, help me. <laughs> Isaac is ready to pass the birthright on. That's the backdrop to our chapter here. Okay? So he calls his oldest son Esau. We all know we talked, we studied hard the birthright a few chapters ago. Birthright normally goes to the oldest son. We know that it's double responsibility, but it's also double land and double blessings and so forth and so on. So he calls his oldest son and he says to him, my son. And he, he Esau, said to him, here I am. Okay, so he's called Esau in and he's talking to Esau and this is what he tells him. Verse 2. Isaac Yitzhak said, Behold now, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. In other words, I think I'm dying. Okay? That's what he's saying. Now, that please take your gear, your quiver, your bow, go out to the field and hunt game for me. Okay? Isaac, you're about to die. And what do you care about? You care about a good meal. <laughs> you're caring about the physical appetite. Really? <laughs> okay. Now, some of you may have something that leads you to think of deer meat in, in the description. 
um, because it's called game or whatever you know version you have it's highly unlikely it was a deer because we're in the land of Israel there were goats there were mountain goats there were wild goats but there really wasn't deer in the area and there still isn't deer in the area it's just not the topography that that's conducive to having a lot of deer the only reason why I bring that out is we're going to see that Rebecca because I think you know the story ahead Rebecca is going to tell Jacob go get a goat from our herd and I'll prepare the food so that's why one saying goat and one saying deer it really probably should be goat okay now it's very um, customary that if there's going to be a ceremony like this the passing of the birthright it usually um, was a custom with a feast yeah, they, you know, they'd make a big deal out of it. <laughs> However, you don't see Isaac doing that. You see this being very private. He hasn't even called his family around. He's only called Esau, just Esau. It's just between dad and his favored son. So the question right here is, did Isaac in his heart know that he was starting to do the wrong thing? And he didn't want anybody giving him any grief about it, so he's just going to plow through and get this done. Well, let's go on with our story and see. He's told his son, he said, go out, hunt game for me. Verse 4, prepare a delicious meal for me such as I love. Bring it to me that I may eat so that my soul may bless you before I die. Okay. He's being ruled by his appetite. No matter how we look at it, he thinks he's at the portal of eternity and his view is occupied with a savory meal. He's about to give the blessing away for a mess of, and this time I can't say lentils, this time I say for a mess of meat, goat meat, venison, whatever it is, okay? So, like father, like son. They're both about ready to give up something spiritual for a meal, for food that is just food. Okay, this was absolutely direct opposition to what God had said in chapter 25 and verse 23. Let's review that real quickly because it's very important. Genesis 25 and verse 23, what had God said? Chapter 25 and verse 23. God speaking to Rivka, to Rebecca in this chapter. She's got her womb having a battle going on. There's a war going on inside of her. And she's wondering what's going on. And so she says to God, you know, why am I in this condition? She's inquiring of the Lord. Verse 25, the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples will be separated from your body. One people will be stronger than the other. Nothing wrong unusual yet, but that last phrase, and the older will serve the younger. Okay, God's setting in order. He's going against the natural order. He is saying birthright's going to go to the younger. The younger son is going to be head. The older son is going to be subservient to the younger brother. Okay, God told Rebecca that. Now, do you think that she didn't share with her husband what God had revealed to her. I think very much as soon as God had revealed it to her, she made a beeline for Yitzhak. She said, guess what? You know, I, I've been pleading before the Lord. I've been praying before me. He's told me I've got two babies in my womb. What's more, they're going to both grow up to be nations. They're going to have great out um, progeny, great, you know, Sibling, not siblings, seedlings come from them. There's a word I want. I Lord help my vocabulary today. Anyway, they're going to have families. They're going to grow up to be two nations. But God also said something very unusual, Isaac. He said that the younger is going to rule. The elder is going to be subservient. I'm as positive as can be. Rebecca told everything to Isaac. She kept it in her heart. Isaac would have kept it in his heart. We move on down through time. So Isaac knows God has said. Now, if you want to go against what God says, suffer the consequences. Learn a lesson. What God says happens. Okay? Back to chapter 27. Back to, we've read verse 4 now. 
Um, yeah, I've told you everything. So he's sending Esau out, go get me the meal that I like, my favorite meal. And then once I have filled myself with it, I'm going to bless you in the presence of the Lord. Be Oops, sorry, that's later. He didn't say that in the beginning, sorry. <laughs> okay, the meal is so that I can bless you before I die. Now, plot thickens. <laughs> Verse 5. Now, Rebecca, Rivka, was listening while Yitzhak, Isaac, spoke to his son Esau. Okay, she's listening. Um, let me make sure I brought you everything out. No, let me back up just a second before we get to what she heard. Okay, it, Isaac's wanting to intensify his affections. He wants to bless Esau with his whole heart. The Hebrew word, when he says that my soul may bless you, before I die, that soul means the whole heart and mind, everything into it. He's putting all his energy into his flesh. It's the same level that Rebecca and Jacob are going to be dealing with also. They're going to be, everybody's going to be working in the energy of the flesh rather than in the spiritual. Now, Isaac couldn't even taste the difference we're going to see between what Esau would get from the field and what Rebecca is going to do from their flocks. So it, it wasn't even that the taste of the food was that much better. What it was is, hey, Esau, my boy that I'm proud of, you're a he-man, you're a man's man, you're, you're just, you're strong and you're out there and you, you, you know, take down your enemies and you're just, you're a man's man. That's what he was proud of in Esau. Jacob probably was a little too meek and mild for Isaac's taste. He wasn't standing up to the plate and being tough and being rough and, and it just didn't appeal to Isaac as much. So that's really what's going on. He's prizing Esau as a mighty hunter because it shows him to be that tough brawn. You know, we, we know that in our culture to this day. Honestly, if I took a survey of men who had issues with, their dad had issues with them, and I would ask them, how many of your dads had issue with you because you'd rather read a book than be involved in sports? And almost everyone will raise their hand and say, yeah, exactly. My dad wanted me in sports. He wanted me out there, you know, showing the world what a great, you know, player I am. Reading a book? Really? Come on. What's that all about, you know? And this was the difference that was really tweaking Esau. I'm sorry, tweaking Isaac, okay? Now, so with that in mind, he wants to, uh, it says, that my soul may bless you. In order that, with all that I've got, I want to give you that best. Okay. Flip over with me to Hebrews real quick. Hebrews 11 and verse 20. Talking about the same thing, but brings out a very important point to us. So, and I just lost my, there we go. Okay, Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to look at verse 20. In Hebrews 11, verse 20, it tells us, By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, even regarding things to come. Okay, by faith, he blesses both his sons. Now, if I took you to Romans 10 and verse 17, it says, Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Once again, that says to me, if Isaac's going to bless his sons by faith, he's heard the word of God, because that's how we have our faith, is by hearing the word of God. Nobody can have faith in God without hearing about God. That's just the way that it works. So he had to have known God's message to Rebekah, and in that, he is going to bless right, but we're going to see that come in chapter 28 just before Jacob flees to Laban. We're not going to see it right here and right now. Uh, he's actually going to do it but by, 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 quote, accident, according to him. Okay, again, the fact that Esau has married two heathen wives, there are grief to Isaac and Rebekah. It shows all the more that Isaac's partiality to Esau was not spiritually directed. Isaac in his carnal flesh is putting Esau above Jacob. 
having two heathen women who are going to be mamas to the children, that should have been a huge discontender. Even if Isaac wanted Esau to have the blessing, by the time Esau's taken that step and married two heathen women, Isaac himself should have said, you just blew it, but it's all over. I can't send the blessing that's going to lead to the, the through the spiritual seed, the leading to the Messiah through two heathen women. It just does not work. It has to be from that promised line. So um, what can I say? Um, Isaac's just in his flesh. He, his appeal is to his son Esau. He might even be living vicariously through Esau. Who knows? But Esau is what appeals to him. Now, Isaac knew in his own life. Where did he get his bride? Isaac, he was sent away to get her. Right. Back home. The servant was sent back to the family to bring a godly wife to him to marry. Now, why did Abraham do that if it didn't matter who you married? If it didn't matter if you marry heathen or believers, why would they have gone to the degree to go get him a wife? And Abraham was even so concerned, don't take my son because he might get caught up with some heathen dumb. Just go to my family. You know, God will direct you. Bring back a godly wife for Isaac. So Isaac should have realized he should have sat his sons up also. If there weren't godly wives around there to choose from, godly women, I'm sorry, around there to choose from, he should have been doing the same thing. Let's get your wives from back in the family. Now that is what they're going to do for Jacob. That's literally what they're going to do. Rebecca's going to go to Isaac and say, he can't marry the heathen girls. I can't have this son married to Hittites. We need to send him back to the family. Let's get him back there. Let him get a godly wife. And, of course, that, that's what does happen. But, uh, again, we just have to question where was Isaac's mind because he's so caught up in his flesh and his fleshly desire and his appeal for his choice that he's even willing to try to supersede what he has been told is God's will and God's way. That's a, a dangerous place to be in. So now with that in view, in chapter 27 and in verse 5, we've got Rebecca here. Okay, She was listening. Um, Isaac obviously is doing this without telling Rebecca. So she's overhearing. Okay, It's not that she's in the room and being part of this. He's called his son privately, and Rebecca's happening to hear. Okay, Maria, you have a question? Or a comment? Keep trying. We're trying to. It should be happening. There you go. You're on. You know, I have, it's just a question that, that uh, it always, because Abraham was was not a, a Jewish, he was not Jewish. He did a crossed over, correct? Abraham becomes a Hebrew. Hebrew means crossed over. Isaac is an Israelite because he lives in the land of Israel. Jacob okay. follows suit, but he, he, you can put the word Jew on Jacob, but really it comes out of his son Judah, Jew being the short form of it, that the tribe of Judah were the first ones called Jews, but it becomes synonymous for all 12 tribes. Okay, so... Um... My, my question here actually is, was uh, um, Isaac's uh, wife was taken from Abraham's family? Yes, yes. It wasn't that there were no other believers in Abraham's family, but there was idolatry all around them. God had to separate Abraham from his entire family to get Abraham to be on track with him and him alone. Abraham goes out believing in the one true and living God. He crosses over, literally over the river, over Euphrates, Tigris, and goes to the promised land, the land that God said, I'll show you. And then he told him he would give it to his descendants. So he, by faith, left that home. He didn't get saved en route. He was a believer. He had to have been a believer in God to hear God, to follow God, to go out. 
We see it confirmed in chapter 15 when God shows him the whole plan and he believes and it's accounted for righteousness. But he obviously had that bend to believe in the one true and living God. Remember, we've got to go back further than Abraham. We've got two lines. We've got the line of Seth that leads down to Noah. And we out of Noah, we've got Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Uh, out of Ham, we have the curse line. That would be the same line that we saw with Adam and Eve with Cain, the cursed line. And Seth replaces, of all, Abel with the godly line. And we have Genesis 6, 4 referred to Seth's line as the godly line. So you've got Seth and you've got Cain. Then when we come down to Noah and you've got the three sons that all the families come out of now because we've had the flood and everybody else has been washed away, Ham becomes a cursed line because of what Ham does. And God says that curse line is going to go right down. In fact, the line of the Canaanites, Canaan, is Ham's son was Canaan. That's the name. And because Canaan settled in that land, it became called the land of Canaan. That's how we get the name. Those are the ungodly, the, the, not the spiritual line. Shem, which stands for name, which we know when we hear Hashem, the name we're referring to God, carries the spiritual line. Out of that spiritual line, we come down to, um, to eventually to Abraham, to Isaac, you know, and it keeps going. So and God always so had. Said, Go ahead. Yeah. So what you said at the beginning is that Isaac was not a Jewish descent, but by faith, because he lived in a in a in a, in a country or whatever that was uh, was not godly. They were not. Uh, God followers. Right, right. So, yes. Okay, so that's why. Yes. Okay. Yeah, there isn't a Jewish race yet, really. The, yeah. the Jewish race, their ancestry is Abraham and Isaac, Jacob, but the name Jew and calling it a race of people really comes out of the Jacob sense. That's really where it comes from. But again, that it if you follow their ancestry, you get back to, so that we say the forefathers of Israel, the forefathers of the promised line, the forefathers of our Jewish faith are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But yes, um, Abraham is following God and obedient to God and teaching that to his family. You've got Lot, his nephew who comes in, stays with him, but Lot's got an eye for the world. We see where that goes off. Lot's two daughters have relations with Lot, and out of them come the Moabites and the Ammonites, which are two um, heathen peoples who came against the, the, the Israelites. Um, we see Ruth come out of the Moabites, cross over, and become a proselyte into Judaism, but the people were heathen. You know, and I'm talking, you know, in, in the general. So when we have Abraham living in the land of Israel, living nomadically, he's doing well because as a nomad, he's living more or less by himself with his people, his herds, and he's listening and following his God. When he didn't listen to his God, he went down into Egypt, gets in trouble with the king of down in Egypt, who doesn't know God, but God's still able to talk through him, wakes him up in a dream, and says thus and so, and tells him, you, you pray for Abraham, to, you ask Abraham to pray for you, that you don't die. You know, so again, it shows the line that knew the truth was Abraham only. You know, that any who wanted to come into that faith could. I believe Hagar well, I, I, came into it. Yeah, what, what I take is uh, the, uh, the Abraham wanted uh, his family because I'm sure that his family uh, uh, realized that he was a, a follower of that one true God. Therefore, I want a wife from Yes, okay. yes, okay. you got it, yes, <laughs> yeah. It wasn't that Abraham was the only believer, but yes, yes, right. and he separated himself. When we are saved and we say that we are separated to God, that's the, what the word holy means, that God sees us as holy, we're separate from the world, and we're separated unto God. So Abraham separated himself from the world of idolatry, he was separate unto God, but yes, obviously his brother knew of the faith, and his brother's daughter, who becomes Isaac's wife, was a, a believer in the one true and living God also. And I'm sure when she came in under Isaac's wing with Abraham as her father in love, 
that I'm sure Abraham spiritually poured into both Isaac and Rebecca. So she would grow in her faith and she would be in line with that to nurture that in her children. Well, Jacob had that heart. He wanted the spiritual. Esau didn't have that heart. And we're going to see their two lines go on. Esau also becomes a nation of people. We're going to see very soon that they're called the Edomites in Scripture. They come against Israel. They're brother against brother, you know, but really? hat filled in the middle. Interesting place. because we, we, we can also see that what, when you were saying why uh, <clears throat> Abraham didn't want uh, a, uh, or Isaac it was the one, that, that didn't want the, uh, the, um, um, the, the same wife or the same dark wife for, for uh, Isaac. Abraham wanted and a godly wife for Isaac. Isaac should have wanted godly wives for Esau and Jacob. And for Esau, Isaac and Esau. And, and I think that at that time, you know, even without, with me, sometimes we listen, and if we listen to the Holy Spirit, we act upon it without even realizing. That's what I wanted to bring up. Yes. Because, yes. see, um, God will see the heart of, of, uh, of Isaac and the heart of Esau. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. We should be so in tune with the Spirit of God, especially we in this day and age of the Spirit living within us, mm -hmm. that He can direct us, like you said, even when we're really not aware, we can look back and say, wow, I see how God directed me. But we should be that close and that sensitive, absolutely. And Isaac, if he was spiritually minded at this time, he would have had to say, whether I like it or not, I'm to bless with that birthright and double blessing, I'm to bless Jacob. This is the one who is to exactly. carry it on. And we're told that God chose Jacob before the twins had ever done anything. So it isn't that mm -hmm. Jacob earned it. It was God's sovereign will. But I do believe God gave that heart to Jacob, knowing Jacob would respond with that heart, would love the God of Israel, and would want to instill that in his sons. And it goes on down the line so that we have a godly line that does bring forth the Messiah in time, the, the promised seed. So, but yeah, we, we you know... We've got to not lean on our flesh and walk in our flesh and think in our flesh. We've got to be spirit directed. Out, absolutely. Okay, Dora. Okay. No wonder we're in such a mess because even way, <laughs> even way back then, uh, it was just a very fine line because although Laban was was a chaser and so was um, Jacob. But there was a little heart, I mean, bad head. Keep going with me and decide at the end how much you want to use that word shyster on Jacob. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because there's a lot of... I mean, yeah, because out he, there. he fooled his father. Yes. Although he was going to get it, but he was the mother. And, and, and this is where and the mother always one. takes one side or the other of the kid. So from way back then, all of this curse is passed on to us. Because they were really, they really didn't have, like we have the Bible that we can study the Bible and see God and, and, and teach our kids. Well, they didn't have nothing, so they were just kind of like the feeling of God, I guess. Because oh, why? God did appear to them. God walked with, well, he walked with Adam in, in, in a way that we've seen, but he appeared to Abraham. He guided Abraham. Isaac, we saw when he built that altar, the Lord appeared to him. So it wasn't that they didn't have it as much. They had something that could have kept them right in line. But it's always the same thing. We always have that choice. Are we going to listen and follow the Lord and the Lord alone? And yes, I'll hold us more responsible because we each have our own Bibles and we have the Spirit indwelling us. We have a lot more reason why we should be able to do it right. And yet I don't see us do a whole lot better, yeah. unfortunately. But the one thing I will say in case if some of you are not back with me next week, um, and actually it'll be two weeks because I'm missing next week, but when, when we call Jacob 
shyster, we'll call him deceiver, when we use all that, I will give you. Jacob and Rachel acted in their flesh, but they did it to bring about what they knew was God's will. To call him out and say that's his character, that's how he always is, out of one act, one time, when he had the right reason, the wrong way to do it. The, the, the end doesn't justify the means. So I call him out, he did it wrong, but he did it for the right reason, if I can say that. I'm just saying we malign his character when we associate that word with him. We're going to see a whole lot more of his character and a whole lot more that he did in his life than to allow one time of this. Esau's going to say, oh, he's, he's supplanted me twice. And supplant, he's using the way meaning he's tried to grab my heel to trip me up. Now, was that really what he was doing when he came out of the womb? <laughs> really? Show me an a infant, a week old, that is able to think to that degree. I want to usurp somebody else. And I think everybody would say, well, you're crazy. You know, that baby's not capable of that yet. Give them a couple years and they're capable. <laughs> we see it. We see a two-year-old absolutely able to manipulate, but a, a week old? Let's go to literally one day. You know, they haven't even lived a day in this life. I believe that he was coming out quickly. It was not to be a foreshadowing of what his whole life was like. God does not malign Jacob. We're going to see God blesses Jacob right after this episode. If God thought Jacob was that bad and that out of line, why don't we see God's hand heavy in correction? Why don't we see him pull him up short? We see consequences come out of Jacob and Rebekah taking things into their own hands. And that's what we've got to take away from it. No matter how much you know, this is what God wants. It doesn't give you a right to make it happen. You, you've got to punt back and let God work. What miracle would we have seen if Rebecca had not put into motion and Jacob followed through? So I'm not justifying that, but I'm not ready to say, oh, Jacob's this great supplanter. Jacob's this deceiver. Jacob fooled Esau when he got his birthright from him. Really? An adult who knows the choice, who makes the choice according to his physical appetite. The same way Isaac right now is making his choice according to his physical appetite. We've got the same thing happening, but why don't we say Isaac then is a great shyster and a great deceiver and that's his whole character. See, it's not. It's not. I'm not Isaac made a boo-boo. He he did an oops. He's he's going to realize <laughs> He's human, yeah. But he's going to realize when we get to the end of this chapter and he realizes how God's pulled him up short, he's going to recognize that. Oh, my word. I'm sure he had to think, thought to himself, what did I almost do? And it shook him to his core. We're going to see that from the Hebrew. I'll bring that out to you. So I'm not in any way justifying Isaac. I'm not justifying Rebecca. I'm not justifying Rachel, how did I get Rachel in there? Let's try <laughs> Jacob, and I'm not going to justify Esau. All four blew it, <laughs> okay? All four are human. All four are making major mistakes in this chapter. Esau is trying to grab what he might have even thought to himself the day that he sold his birthright to his brother. Well, I can do whatever that, that'll appease my little brother to get what I want because I know I got dad in my back pocket. And when it comes down to it, dad's going to bless me. I'm the older. I'm going to get it. That easily could have been his attitude. He was not at the moment of death and in a moment of literal physical weakness with his last breath. Okay, then I'll give it to you. Help. No, no. He was an adult had others around him that he could have gone to for help, could have walked right out of that tent, helped himself out of that pot that was always boiling. If he had the strength to go out to try to hunt down an animal, he's not close to death. If you're close to death, are you going to go take it on you to go hunt a wild animal? No, you're going to be laying in a bed. So, so there was no deceiving. Esau showed his character. I don't care about that. That's all spiritual stuff. I don't care about that. I just want the food. 
now we're going to see Isaac saying, I don't care what Rebecca has said. I want my He-Man son to carry on the birthright, the blessing, the title, you know. I, I want a strong man to be the, the head of the family instead of I want a spiritual man to be the head of the family. Is it possible, you know, when um, Jacob grabbed his heel, that could be God's spirit, you know, he was, he would be the one to, possible, because God can do mysterious things. Well, sure God can, but really, if Jacob hadn't even done that, still what was going to happen would happen. Mm -hmm. So, I tend to think more, because it puts him in a bad light, I tend to think more, it wouldn't have been the hand of God, it would have been, I'm not going to say it, because I don't believe that the hand of Satan could do it, but it would, would have been more that, because they give it that misconnotation, you know. So, Esau was never tricked out of it. Yeah. He yeah. openly chose to make his decision. Right. It's the same way you've got kids today that'll try to say, well, it's so-and-so's fault, and you'll say, no, you're the one who chose. I'm very big on responsibility. You choose. You choose to do right or you choose to do wrong, okay? And if someone else is doing wrong around you, you choose still yourself. You can't say, well, the blame's on so-and-so. We see that all the way back to the garden. When God calls Adam up on his sin, what's Adam say? She made me do it. <laughs> yes, and she passed the buck to Satan. But when the day was over, who did God hold responsible? Each one. Each one. Satan had consequences come on him. Eve had consequences come on her. Adam had consequences come on him. Not one of them did God say, yeah, you're right, it's the other one's fault. Not one. He held them all accountable and all responsible. But that is a hard punishment when they got kicked out. I mean, they just, they, you know, that's rock, that desert. How can you make a living? It was hard. It sure was hard. They're going mm -hmm. from a wonderful environment, mm -hmm. uh, an environment where they're walking and talking with God continually to being cast out of that let alone the push and the, the the you know and and now having to work by the sweat of their brow i i don't think they even began to realize at that very moment what all it cost them it was a high cost mm -hmm. but it had to be because it broke the fellowship with god they came it up in the face of god and said but God said, uh-uh. And that has to have a huge consequence. It's the same way when any person is going to stand before God at the great white throne judgment. Who stands before God at great white throne? Uh-uh. Um, you will never stand at the great white throne. Mm -hmm. You sinners, will never. Sinners. sinners. Yes, unsaved. Sinners. Yes. Sin yes. And I say that. Oh, okay. Then I misunderstood. Sorry. <laughs> but I say that because I hear people say, oh, when I stand before God, you know, when he's judging in the, on the great white throne. No. Mm -hmm. If you have Jesus in your heart, your sins were washed away. They're forgotten. They were put as far as the east is from the west. And I love this. When does the east meet the west? Never. Never. If you're traveling east, you don't suddenly find yourself traveling west. Mm -hmm. But if you travel north, when does the north meet the south? At the poles. Yep. You're suddenly traveling south. And if you're traveling south and you get to the pole, you're suddenly traveling north. Go ahead, even in the description of sins from the east to the west is showing us your sins will never come back. They'll never meet you. You don't catch up with them. They don't catch up with you. They're thrown, they're cast into the deepest of seas, and then God's put up a sign, no fishing. You can't pull them back up because you're forgiven. Don't let Satan pull them up and throw them in your face. When he reminds you of your sins, you remind him of his future. Hey, you, you're going to end up in the lake of fire forever. <laughs> I'm going to end up in heaven forever. What, and I'll even be so brave. We're going to stand in the count of every word we say. When we stand at the judgment seat, the Bema seat of Christ, we are in heaven when we're standing there. Now, nobody gets into heaven unless their sins have been forgiven. 
So we're not there to be judged for our sins. We're there to be judged for what we did or what we didn't do for the Lord. So we'll have reward or loss of reward. In that, it will be revealed. You said or you did, you're forgiven for that, but you've lost your reward there. You didn't say or do what you should have according to the will of the Lord. So the accountability is not for salvation, not for the consequence, any sin. One sin is equal to all sin. The, the scriptures say that if they broke one uh, commandment of the law, they were guilty of it all. So those things that you said amiss, that you did amiss, those things you think, I did this for the Lord, and you did it in your own power, the Lord will reveal that. Here you are, you're saying, I'm doing this for the Lord. No, you're not. Here's where your heart was in that. You don't get reward for that. But that's all you lose is reward. You lose a crown. You lose a jewel. But you're in heaven. Nobody gets kicked out of heaven except Satan who got into heaven in a different way. We got into heaven through the shed blood of Jesus. That's not how Satan got in heaven. You know, He was in God's presence when he enter into his heart entered pride and he fell and he's going to fall even lower still okay but that's that's what it's meaning for your reward or your loss of reward you're held accountable because god in essence is saying just because you're saved doesn't mean oh i got a free ticket now I can go do whatever I want. It doesn't matter. No, it'll come back to haunt you. It'll come back to, you'll be called up on it that, that you did this and you shouldn't have or you said that or, or whatever. But it's not that you're standing there for judgment of salvation or uh, lack of. I didn't think that it was that. But, but a lot of people say it. I hear them say it. Yeah. Oh, you're going to be held accountable. You know, God's going to hang it out on the, the laundry line. No, not in the way that for the unsaved, when they stand before God, God's first going to open the book of life. Okay, God does have books. This is Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur for our Jewish people. God does have books. He does have the book of life. But if you read the scriptures the right way, get into their original language, and what you read is basically, and this, this goes against a lot of people's thoughts but I'll give you scriptures every name was written in the book of life because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son before the foundations of the earth God had planned how we could be saved that was all in God's plan he wrote every name in the book of life because there's not one person who will stand before God who's who can say well you didn't die for me Yes, I did. You didn't accept it, but I did die for you. When they leave this earth, and I believe it's not until they leave this earth, but when they leave this earth through death, it's sealed. They don't get a second chance. Where you are spiritually when you leave this earth, saved or unsaved, is where you are for eternity. Or as Roger's truck bumper sticker says, eternity, smoking or non-smoking. <laughs> <Okay? laughs> That's where you're at for eternity. At that time, when there's no longer breath in them on this earth, it's over. That's when I believe God blots the name out of the one who did not receive the Son for salvation, who did not open their hearts to the Lord Jesus. Not before, unless by God's knowing, he says, I know they cross that line. They harden their heart to the point they send away their day of salvation. They would never come back. He can do that because he knows. We can never judge that. Amen. Please don't judge it. You have no idea what happens in the last moments of a person's life. If God was willing to spare the thief on the cross, he didn't say it's too late for you. You can't get off that cross and do something to prove it. You can't show a changed heart. You didn't do anything. You lived a rotten life. No, no. Yeshua Jesus said to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. He saw that thief. That thief looked at the Lord, looked at the way he was taking what was going on, knew he deserved death, and knew this one didn't, and knew, hey, whatever you're standing for, I believe in that. That's where I want to be. Never, never think it's over until they're literally declared 
dead. My dad was, and this is only one, one time, many a time, but the one that pops in my mind right now, unsaved Jewish man, my dad had witnessed to him for years and years and years. His wife had become a believer. She was a witness to him. His kids, his grandkids, everybody in the clan was saved except for Larry. Larry was the holdout. Larry had health issues. He knew it wouldn't be long before he died. He loved my dad and he told my dad, I want you to do my, my funeral service. And my dad would say, good, get saved so I can do a good service. <laughs> you know? And I mean, it, my dad was open with his testimony, Larry. Larry was full of his pride. He, you know, I'm going to do it my way, okay? Larry went into a coma several days, if I remember right, at least a couple of days before he did pass away. It, it wasn't known that that was what was going to happen like anybody else is in a coma. There are those who come back, there are those who don't. In the wee hours of the morning, my dad was awakened. He knew in his heart instantly God had awakened him and said, Go to Larry. Go see Larry. My dad made his way to the hospital, in the ICU, because his clergy could get right to Larry's bedside. Larry is in a coma. He pleaded with Larry. He gave him the gospel one more time, got in his ear and said, Larry, you know, will you now open your heart to your Messiah, to your Savior? Spelled out the gospel. Now, there was one little sign that gave my dad a shred of hope, but that was all. And I can't tell you what happened because Larry didn't regain consciousness, didn't speak, and did pass away. But what I can tell you is, in my mind, why would God send my dad out in the wee hours of the morning to witness to him one last time if there wasn't hope that Larry would open his heart to the Lord? So we have hope that we'll see Larry. My dad now knows because he's in heaven. I still wonder, but I have great hope. If my, if my Lord woke up my dad and sent him out, there was still hope that Larry would in those last moments you know, you lose your pride when you're there at the end. What good is your pride going to do you? So I have great hope. I could tell you story after story like this where we have that hope. I'm touching somebody's heart here in my class very much because right now she's just had a loved one very close in her family leave this earth. And my words of comfort to her before this class was, we never know in those last moments. And my hope is even that God had this come up in class today to assure her in her heart that it's okay with her loved one. That's, that's my hope, that that's what's speaking to her heart at this very moment. I know the Lord's not willing that any should perish. How did I get off on this? I don't even remember now. But where there is life, there is hope. Speak to people. Share with people. If they're in a coma, we're told by the medical world, the hearing goes last. No surprise there. No surprise there. They can hear. Would there not be a, a dad in their life? You don't think God would send an angel? The angels are his messengers who are ministering to those about to receive salvation. You don't think God would send an angel? I can give you angel stories where I know God sent angels. <clears throat> Why would he not to a person's bedside in their last moments before they leave? And again, I'm trying to frantically remember how I got off on this. <laughs> but I trust it's ministering to hearts. And I trust it helps us all to realize how important it is. Nobody knows tomorrow. Nobody knows. Nobody gets in a car and expects to not go to their destination. Nobody expects... A hurricane to come and wash them away. Nobody expects a fire to come and the house to burn down and the father of the house loses life in it. I've lived through that one. Not my dad, but my neighbors. We never know. So that's why I'm so, don't put it off. But, oh, I was talking about the books of life. That's how I got off on this. That God does have a book of life. And at the great white throne judgment, the first book that's open is a book of life. So Joe Blow, and I'm going to call him Joe Blow because I don't think there's anybody named Joe Blow, <laughs> is standing before God and, and is trying to say, oh, I deserve to go into your heaven. I lived a good life. I'm a good person. And God says, well, number one criteria is, is your name in the book of life? Because the only ones that can go on in life in heaven 
are the ones whose names were written in the book of life. They open that book, and I don't know, here's our lack of being told. Is it alphabetical order? Okay, Joe Blow, B's, let's go to the B's. Here's, you know, before his name, and here's after his name, but B-L-O-W, there's no blow there. You know, I don't know how it is, but they're going to see it blotted out. They're going to see their name is not in the book of life. Well then, if your name's not in the book of life, you're not allowed into heaven. Let's see what your consequence is. Now God opens the books, and it's plural in, in the original. And in those books, the book is opened. That's Joe Blow's life. And here's how he, he led his life. And let's say he was a really good person. He did all kinds of good deeds. He fed those who were hungry. He never dealt badly with his business partners. He raised his children to be good, moral children. This is right, this is wrong, be good. You know, he did all kinds of good things in his life. But he was an enemy of the cross. Okay, he right. did not believe in the cross. No, I can do this. I'm a good person. I hear somebody very famous in our lifetimes. I did it my way. Yeah. And God's going to open up his word and say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No I man comes the to the Father through but through me. Did you come through me? No, I did it my way. Well, I'm sorry, your way is not perfect because Joe, yes, you lived a good you life. Go this way, sis. You gotta go this way. But you also did this and you also did that and you did this and you did that because no one lives perfectly. If they live perfectly, they can be in heaven, but no one does. And so then, as Dora just said, he goes that way. And if he lived a good life, he doesn't suffer in the same manner as one who lived a horrendous life, who did all kinds of bad deeds, because that's only fair and just. So that someone who didn't do harm and mayhem and all the rest doesn't suffer to the same degree as the one who did. How does God do that? I don't know. I just know God is fair and God is just. Now, in that same way, those in heaven before the judgment seat, the Bema seat of Messiah, of Christ, in heaven tells you already you're saved. You've made it into heaven. You're secure. That's your future. But now let's see what kind of rewards you get. And that one who did a lot for the Lord, you may never have heard of them. Well, who's that person? Oh, they lived out in Timbuktu, and, and you know, they, they never got on the map for anything. But they lived a godly life, and they instilled in the hearts of others the love of the Lord, and they did everything that the Lord asked them to do with their lives. They did. They're going to get a huge, a full reward. We all think, oh, that's a Billy Graham. He's going to get a big reward because look at all the people he led to the Lord. Well, God called him to do that. God called that person in that corner that was hidden to do that. It didn't matter how many they did. What mattered did they fully obey the Lord. They'll have that same reward for full obedience to the Lord. They'll have jewels. They'll have diamonds. They'll have whatever. They'll have crowns. There's different crowns we're told we can earn. When we are a soul winner, we earn that crown. We're told, um, oh goodness, crown of faith. I don't remember all of them right now. There's five crowns. So there are different crowns that we can earn. There are different jewels in the crowns. We don't know exactly how it is. But I love the fact of what do we see happen with those crowns? Anybody know what we do with our crowns? Dora knows. Dora knows when we are worshiping our Lord and we are thanking Him when we see the glories that happen, when we are in that forever and we realize this it's over. It's over. There's no more pain. There's no more suffering. There's no more ugliness. There's no more death. There's no more horrors. Not only is there no more, but there's all the more. We're literally in the Shekhinah presence of our God. He is so bright. There's no darkness. It is nothing but joy. Why are we changed before we get in heaven? Because this body will explode. 
it can't handle it. There are times when I get so excited in the presence of the Lord, I think I'm going to explode. My heart's jumping out of me, and I think this is it. I'm just going to shatter into a thousand pieces, and my thousand pieces are going to say, I love you, Jesus. Can you imagine being there? Can you imagine not only this is all done, but oh my word, what we're seeing. And if anybody's ever had a time that somebody's rescued them in this life or somebody they, they love, what do you hear? They gush with thank you. They want to show that person. They, they bring them baked goodies and, and they give them gifts and they do whatever they can to show appreciation to that person who spared their life. Now take that on to the godly level, and I'm up in heaven, and I want to express how thankful I am to my God. I am so excited. I want to give you something, Jesus. <gasps> I got a crown. I can give you my crown, and I'm going to throw it back at his feet and say, I worship you. Everything is yours. I adore you. you here, wear another crown, Lord. Wear every crown, because you're the one worthy of being crowned crowned with glory, crowned with honor, crowned with praise. Let him hear the praises of my whole heart, soul, mind, and being. That's what I'm going to do with my crowns. And that's why I want a thousand million crowns, because I want to throw a thousand million crowns at my Lord. I want to give him, and I want to keep giving him, and I want to keep giving him, and I want more to give him. So let me do everything I can, Lord, to Amen. earn a crown so that I can throw it at your feet one day. Because I don't want to be up there empty hand and saying, I wish I had something I could give you, Lord. I want to have. I feel like I haven't done much of anything. So do I, Loretta. It's just, I want to share that love with you. Exactly, exactly. When you've been loved much, you want to love much. When you've been forgiven much, you want to forgive much. I mean, I, I see all your faces. I wish you could see what I see, because I see faces aglow all over Zoom room, all over my living room. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but let it, let it minister to your soul. <clears throat> let it give you the reason to hang in there a little bit longer, because I don't know about you all, but I'm homesick, and I'm tired of this world, and I'm tired of the pain and the suffering of those that I love that are around me. When one cried today here, I wanted to cry with her. I love her and I hurt for her and I just made her cry again. I'm sorry. <laughs> let me let me be patient, Lord. But we, let me stay not another to day. Do when you work, but when we get up there and he starts asking, "What did you do for reward?" We're going to be for reward. Yeah, we're not working for our salvation. No. We're not working so he'll look at us and say, oh, you're a good person. I'll let you yeah. in. No, we're working because we love him. And didn't you ever have someone in your life, I hope, if not a parent, and I realize not all parents are good examples, but a boss, a teacher, somebody that you really liked and you want to please them. You know, you see that naturally in little children. You know, I've been a teacher in the classroom as well as in, in Bible class. And with the little ones, they are so quick to want to please you. They are so quick. And when they get a pat on the head or a good, you know, for you or a sticker that says, you know, they're just lit up. God just put that in us, you know. And, and I want the accolades from my Lord. I want them now. I want to feel his pleasure now. And I'll tell you, thank you. Because you all are a blessing to me. Getting to teach you today, I feel his joy. I'm getting that. I'm, I'm doing what the Lord wants me to do at this moment. I'm not telling you I live perfectly. Oh, how I wish I did. But I know far better. I live with me. <laughs> and the Bible even tells us we, may, we do sins that we don't even, we're not even aware of we're doing. That's why it's so beautiful when he says he forgives our sins, our trespasses, and our iniquities. They cover everything. The sins we know, the sins premeditated, the sins we didn't know. I don't care what category you put it in. He says, I took care of it. I paid the price. I washed it away. But I'm smart enough to know I don't live every moment pleasing him. Is that my goal? Oh, yes, that's my goal. Let me sign up, Lord. Fill me up. 
Pour me out because only in you and the power of your spirit can I live pleasing to you. That's why in the spirit my words will receive reward in heaven, but in my flesh my words will fall short of getting that reward. That's where we are and that's where it's at. And so even, even today, getting this joy to teach you, to share with you, probably everyone you could get up here and say it, maybe even better than I have, but today the Lord gave me that opportunity, and I can only thank you for allowing me to share what is my blessing from the Lord. You all have different gifts. God's given to each one. And when you're in the flow of your gift, you know it and you feel it. So it's not just for me alone. You're in the blessing of the Lord saying, I want you to sit at my feet and fellowship at my word, in my word, at my feet. Have you done that today? I think every single one of us can say that we felt the presence of the Lord today. That's obedience to the Lord, what he wanted of you. There's reward. That's our God. He loves to give out gold stickers or, you know, cherries on top or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> you know, we, we haven't even begun to know what's awaiting us. Last night on the news, they told how the Aurora Borealis, this is the time when it shows across our northern, you know, above. it comes down to Michigan and Wisconsin, places like that where they can see some. That was on my brother's bucket list. He always wanted to see the Aurora Borealis. Guess what? He has now from the other side. <laughs> and I'll bet he's chuckling and saying, you know, I thought that was something. Look at this. <laughs> we have no clue. We have no clue. The joys that await us. And if we knew, I don't think we could stand to wait another day down here. But Lord, give us that grace. And give us that patience that we might reach one more. One more. One more. I'm going to wind up class on this today. It's 3.34. <laughs> I thought we'd get through the whole birthright. <laughs> Remember, we won't pick up next week. We'll pick up the week right after that. But here is the blessing that I'll bring right now. I've told you I call out all four. Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, and Esau. Not one in this chapter do everything right before the Lord. Not one of them. Does that mean it's all over? Does that mean that God says, done with that family, got to find myself somebody else? God help him if he had to. Who would he ever find? You know, nobody. But God loves him through it. And the one thing I can give you is, when this chapter is done, God's will was accomplished. And I'll say it, in spite of, okay? Even if you're in a hard place in your life right now and you know God has promised something and everything's going awry, my word of encouragement to you is stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Don't take it into your own hands. That's what Rebecca did. Oh no, my husband's about to pull a big blooper. I got to jump in here and rescue the day. No, the Lord is the rescuer. Had she gone to the Lord, pleaded before the Lord, Look what's about to happen. God would have stopped Isaac somehow before he would have allowed his will to be thwarted. God's in control. I tell you, we all do a disservice when we try to help God fix it. <laughs> so I encourage you, if you're in a hard place, stand still. My soul wait thou only upon God. My expectation is from thee. Don't take it into your own hands. Jacob, he should have, you know, he, he argued with his mom at first. He should have stood his ground and said, no, I can't do it this way, mom. We've got to go to the Lord. We've got to pray. He doesn't do it either. They both suffer consequences. Isaac's about to do a big boo-boo. God doesn't let him do a big boo-boo. He lets him do a little boo-boo, and he pulls him up short, and we'll see Isaac caught it and realize who who corrected him and Esau who thought that I can get what I want I'm doing it my way will find himself outside of the will of the Lord and not receiving 
what God has promised to those within the will. There are consequences to our actions, but it is our choice. Each and every day, each and every moment. We make choices from the moment we awaken to the moment we go to sleep. You wake up and decide what to wear, what to eat, where to go, whether to be on time, whether to be late, whether to let this person down or whether to help that person out. We make decisions all the time. Start your day. A day hemmed in prayer, less likely to unravel. Start your day. Lord, guide my every step because Psalm 37, 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Lord, stop my steps when they're not in line with your will. Guide my steps that I follow. The light according to the, the, the light, the lamp into our path, the light to our feet. Let me see your light. Let me follow your light. Let me be obedient to your light. Let me live the best fit the humanly possible for you today. And then walk with him and listen to him. Be tuned in because he'll be guiding you. Even when you're not really aware, he'll be guiding you, let alone when you're really aware. But every day then is an adventure to serve him and to please him, to love him a little bit more. How? I don't know. But I think we all know. He opens our capacity. He stretches the tent pegs, however he does it. I think each one of us right now is saying, yeah, my heart loves you just a little bit more today. And I want it to even more tonight and tomorrow and on and on. And praise Him. He keeps us. He does it all. His plan fulfilled to the dot of the I, the cross of the T. And it's perfect, it's right, and it's above us. Hallelujah. Because I haven't met a man yet that I'd want the world according to so-and-so. <laughs> no. Thank you, Lord. The world according to my God, the one true and living God, the God of Israel, which does not exclude, it's through Israel that the world was to know. So the God of the Jew, the Gentile, and I love my dad, the Jew-tile. <laughs> we'll close in a word of prayer. Let's praise him and thank him for who he is and for his keeping ability. Hallelujah, O Lord our God. We praise you all the day long. We meditate on you and on your word, and in that, Lord God, do guide us, do lead us, do protect us, even from ourselves. Lord, may we not run ahead of you. May we not lag behind you. May we not be disobedient. May we just constantly be bowing down before you, presenting ourselves a living sacrifice, allowing you carte blanche to direct us, Lord, that as you say, every step is directed by you. Let us please you, let our capacity for you, for the love for you and obedience to you grow also. And Lord, thank you. Thank you that you died to save us. Amazing grace. Thank you that you live to keep us. Amazing, abundant grace. Thank you that you give us this abundant life here and now and for all of eternity. Yes, we're anxious to go home. Yes, we're anxious to be out of sin, darkness, death, harm, and hurt. Oh, yes, Lord, and to be in the presence of your glory forever. But while we are here, according to your perfect will, Lord, let us bring one more home with us, too. Show us that one that we can, in the next hours or days, Lord, can share your love and let us bring them into the truth of the light that they can choose you and have eternity with you also. But how we thank you and we praise you is by you it's all accomplished, that you do it all. You save us, you keep us, and you bring us home. Yes, Lord, we're listening for the sound and we'll be glad to go. But again, as long as we're here, May we serve you, please you, and share with those who need to know that they too can have the joys forever that are ours. Oh, how we praise you. Oh, how we bow down and adore you. Oh, how we worship you. Oh, how we love you. In the name of our precious Lord and Savior, Messiah Yeshua Jesus. Amen. Amen. God. 
How awesome. Ineffable. <laughs> Indescribable. Hallelujah. Well, I didn't get you out early, and I didn't get through a chapter, but I think we had a great time at his feet. I hope you feel like you've had a plate for me. And they, our prayers will continue. It will continue. You know, for each and every one. Yes, Maria. And open the mics for anyone 